Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I'm the Social Studies Specialist for the Maine Department of Education. Today, um, I'm excited to welcome for the first and potentially many webinars uh, brought to us by OER, the Open Educational Resources Project from the Gates Foundation. We have Trevor Getz, who is a professor of history at San Francisco State University. He is the content principal for the OER project, and he will be here today talking about uh, graphic biographies and the resources that OER has available for you to use in your classroom. So without any further ado, Trevor, take it away. Thank you so much, Joe. And hi, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to join you from uh, the other side of the, the continent, uh, I guess. Um, the OER project is uh, open educational resources um, that you can use for free with no problem, however you need to use them in your classroom. Uh, that's our ethos. And uh, we do what teachers do, we think, which is we identify classroom challenges, some of which are, you know, course long challenges. So we build whole curriculum with, 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 with progressions and all the ideas uh, within them, all of the resources within them. Some of them are, you know, more specific classroom challenges uh, that we can help to mobilize a team that thinks about pedagogy and thinks about content together. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about our graphic biographies. We have 37 of them now, uh, and we keep building them. And the graphic biographies are one of our ways that we solve a big, a big challenge that I'm going to be talking to you about. We've got some other really great uh, projects, you know, that use data, for example, what we call Project X. Uh, you can find this all on the oerproject.com website. Um, and again, they're all aimed at being really really powerful tools for using um, particular types of evidence to, to, to help you in the classroom. Um, and uh, the way they come about always reflects, I think, our ethos and reflects uh, how I think things really work that are effective. Uh, most of the projects I I've really like to work on all work this way. Um, they start with teachers encountering a, a problem um, or a challenge. And look at that, we're getting very, very uh, transcontinental, aren't we? Um, so teachers, teachers we know encounter some challenge, a curricular challenge, for example, or a, a challenge about how to teach something. And the teacher experiments and finds a solution. And in this case, um, we have all kinds of teachers we work with. Um, and there's our team of content experts and, and uh, instructional experts. So we find a solution and then we share it. And that's what I'm doing today. I'm really just trying to share uh, what we uh, tried to come up with to solve a particular problem. So what is the problem? So whether you're teaching sixth grade or 10th grade world history or whatever grade, uh, the problem of world history um, in some ways is that um, it's, well, I, I, I say inhumane. Um, and I, I picked that word pretty carefully. Um, I don't necessarily mean it's inhumane for the students, although there's, a, there's an angle to that. But I mean that it, it, it lacks humans and um, it's very easy for it to lack humanity. And, and, and before I, I just act like a critic because you know academics were taught to critique but I don't just want to be a critic here. I want to say that you know, I have followed, I have followed the world history course since I started to teach it in the late nineties. Um, my heroes were people who had helped to invent the world history course. I came out of college as a, an expert in a very small part of Africa. And my first job at the University of New Orleans, they said, teach two sections of world history. I said, what is that? And, um, and I read about, you know, and, I, and, I, and eventually I worked with the passionate people, you know, the Ross Dunn's of the world, the Laura Mitchell's of the world, the Mary Wiesner Hanks, who created this idea that we should have a course that will do something that a national history course can't. That will help us to understand the connections among and between people and the way in which our local stories are woven into a global fabric. Um, and this is this really powerful thing that world history can do. It can help students to see the patterns that tie us all together. But, but the challenge is that when we do that, when we, when we look at these big patterns, when we look at this big macro level, for students in particular, it's hard for them to see 
that this is tied to individual or community experiences. That the actual social stuff, the actual cultural stuff, the actual, the, the personal stuff of being embedded in a history yourself, of, of seeing other people embedded in a history is really hard to view at this global historical level. This is Thomas Holt, one of my favorite American History Association presidential addresses of all time, where he talks about the levels problem. And he says, look, when you, when you, when you do a micro history, you have a problem in that it, it, the big patterns are invisible. But when, when you do a macro level history, it often yields, he says, atrophied, lifeless, passionless depictions where there seems to be fate driving things. There seems to be big forces, but, but not people, not people as actors and as agents. And, and this is the problem, this lack of humanity is the problem that I really wanted to kind of um, address when I came out of a meeting where I talked to a bunch of really smart world history teachers and big history teachers, middle school and high school teachers talking about um, what engages their students and what doesn't. So, so working with a team, we broke this problem down into, into three pieces, um, if you will, three pieces. Um, so, and now we got the middle of the country, that's great. Um, the three pieces are, uh, first of all, in most world history courses, it's difficult for students to see people at all. And, and I went through a lot of world history textbooks in my time. Um, and they do mention individuals uh, in some cases, but um, nevertheless, for me, um, what I see is, and what our teachers who I'm working with see is, is that, 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 that people are really taking a backstage. Those students also note that um, the people don't often look like them. That's an important question we're going to address. And even where people are mentioned, they're mentioned as part of big patterns, but not as having individual stories. Uh, not having individual stories that are tied to those patterns. And that's the most important thing is where we do get individuals in the course, the individuals are kind of tacked on a little bit most often, right? We don't ask students to work with those individual stories as evidence. Um, it's a really hard thing to do. It takes a lot of time and effort to get there. So, um, and I promise I'm gonna spend most of my time looking at comics with you in some ways, but just to, just to lay this out, we said, okay, so what would a solution look like? Okay, first of all, the solution has to involve literacy. Um, students have to become literate in learning how to decode texts. Um, and for us, we thought about comics pretty quick because uh, comics are a great tool for learning decoding. We'll talk about that. You can decode text. You can decode images. We're going to try that out ourselves uh, and see. Second, um, if we were going to tell the stories of individuals, they had to be something that could be used to test the big claims we're making about patterns in a world history course. So I had to have that. And thirdly, we had to build in what I call authentic inclusivity. And what I mean by that is we wanted a diverse range of individual stories a range that helps students to understand the way in which the world is a very, you know, diverse, differentiated, integrated, interlocked place, um, but not as a, something that's tacked on. Um, it had to be that these stories are important stories for understanding human experience through these big trends we study in world history. So that's what our solution had to look like, um, if you will. So the graphic biographies are uh, our solution. And in the background here, you'll see a, a, a little bit of our one page graphic biography of Ching Shi. Um, I do wanna say that um, I'm happy for you to put in the Q and A anytime you want. Do you have a graphic biography that addresses uh, the shift to agriculture in the ancient world? Whatever it is, um, if you ask, I can tell you. And I can tell you also that all of our graphic biographies are available um, at the website in really high res, you can download them, et cetera. Um, so, you know, feel free to ask me questions about these things as we go along. So here we go. The graphic biographies are biographies of an individual. In a couple of places, there are three individuals. Um, 
This, for example, is a graphic biography of uh, Manuela Sainz, who was a female revolutionary um, uh, working with Bolivar. Um, she had two enslaved people who normally get silenced uh, in her story. And so we told the story of the three of them together, just for example. But usually it's an individual. It's always art and text together. Um, we have a focus on communities and groups that are normally excluded. But most importantly, we design these stories to support the big narratives that are part of most states' world history standards um, and the AP world history standards. Uh, so those are all features. And what do you get on a biography? What is a biography? A biography is a one-page comic, if you will. Um, carefully designed comics really what we're taking into account is all of the theory about how comics express themselves. Um, we consult with, and I actually teach in a comic studies program as it happens. Um, but also along with that are, oh, and, and I should say they're all good history. They're all vetted and edited by three historians and multiple teachers and copy editors, et cetera. Um, they're leveled. Um, most of them are at a high school reading level. Um, some of them are really appropriate for elementary, uh, sorry, for middle school. I will say that um, if you read them slowly as they should be read, uh, because comics should always be read slowly, um, you can help students at, 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 at a lower reading level to use them to investigate and explore um, new terms. Um, and you get a lesson, a, a lesson plan, right? So this is also really important. Um, yes. Um, Deb, that was something that I didn't include and I don't know why. Joe, I'm going to have to sh send you the list. I've got a list. Um, that said, you know, I mean, it's still sometimes useful to ask me questions um, because I can tell you some of the names are going to be unfamiliar, hopefully, right? We're going for unfamiliar people in many cases, so I can help you. Um, but um, I've got a single document that lists them all with, with links in most cases. So I will get that to Joe after this. Um, so the biography you get, you also get the lesson plan. And the lesson plan is uh, carefully designed in sort of a, if you will, a, a three close read style um, so that some of the questions are content mastery questions. Um, the first reading and you just sort of, you know, pull out uh, whether students understand the content. Some of the questions ask them to look at the art and to, to find ways that the art expresses certain things. That's something we'll be talking about going forward as well. Um, and some of the questions ask them, what does this biography tell you about the big question we're studying right now, the industrial revolution or um, the rise of early states in, in Eurasia or the Colombian exchange? And by the way, we designed these biographies so that in some cases they seem to contradict or modify in some ways, the big story that students are getting. And, and that's a feature, not a bug, right? We want students to say, hang on a second. We have all this evidence at a macro level for particular changes, um, particular transformations. We'll look at a couple of those. Um, but this person's life is somewhat different. Why is this person different? Or why are these two biographies showing different experiences of the same thing? Um, because we want students to be able to start thinking about uh, the evidence at all of these levels. So here are some of our era and unit problems, for example, our big questions. Why did humans shift to farming and what was the effect of that, right? So we've got two graphic biographies that address that question. Um, uh, the revolutions of the 19th, 18th and 19th century, right? How uh, did these transform things and what were the limits of those transformations? Got a bunch for those. That question, um, uh, was World War I a total war? What does that mean? We'll look at that one specifically in a little while. Um, or the most recent one where we have a whole bunch of biographies. How has life changed uh, in different parts of the world since 1900? And what explains the similarities and differences of those, of those changes? Um, so we've got uh, LaDonna Blackbull Allard um, uh, with the No Dapple Pipeline protests, um, who is a historian herself of the, of the, of the you know, of, of Plains Native American peoples. Um, as one of our biographies, I got to work with her to develop that biography, it was fantastic. We've got migrants who go from Uganda to the United Arab Emirates 
We've got Syrian refugee, a Syrian young Syrian refugee, uh, the same age as many of your students in the U.S. I got to work with her and the organizations around her. Um, you know, we've got all these biographies that help students to see differences and similarities um, between these stories, and they all have a lesson plan aimed at helping students to to tie those individual stories to these bigger trends. The, the fundamental approach that underpins this is a belief that students in a world history class should be working with evidence at different scales, at different scales to respond to these big problems. And so what you get in the OER project is you get, you get the, our data, our Project X data, for example, which is um, global, looking at global data from our world and data. Um, we've got uh, lesson plans where students look through this global data for change over time. Um, and then regional evidence. Most of this is articles and videos that we do, um, most often on location. So we did a bunch of videos recently in Ghana, um, in the UK, we're just finishing China, the Arabian Peninsula. We had to do those COVID style, but you get regional stories. And then you get these individual stories and they're all evidence. They're all evidence for responding to these big questions. And in that way, we think the graphic biographies are actually really important because they bring those human stories back in, in a way that serves as evidence for students to respond to these big questions. So the graphic biographies aren't just, you know, for engagement, although they're really, they're stupendous for engagement. Um, I do get to sit with teachers and watch them work with students uh, on these things and students really get engaged, it's fantastic. But, but they get engaged in a way in which they are guided by the lesson plan through the material to integrate these into the bigger stories. So for example, here are um, two biographies on the industrial revolution um, and they're very different stories of very different experiences, right? One is uh, Iwasaki Yatoro, who of course creates one of the world's great corporations, Mitsubishi, uh, in Japan during the Industrial Revolution. Um, you'll notice the artwork style. We're gonna read one of these very closely, but um, you'll see that we're very carefully designed um, to be authentic um, and to tell the story in a way that will engage students, but also um, get them to thinking about some of these, uh, some of these questions we're raising. The other is Ottilie Bader, who was a German woman, who was an industrial worker, who became later a labor organizer. And the design of these is, is quite different. The experiences are quite different, um, but they both tie into these broader questions about what was the human experience of the industrial revolution? What kinds of changes did it make? And how did people, how did human beings play a role in making those changes. Um, here's just a, a view of the additional lesson material that comes with all of these. Um, for the teacher, it includes an extended biography that's somewhat longer than what the students have and in text form. Um, usually it's about a page, page and a half biography um, and includes all these questions that ask students to uh, respond to content and then to begin to um, corroborate or evaluate um, what these stories mean for what they're learning about bigger things like the Industrial Revolution. So recently I had the great pleasure, um, I'll, I'll go back to that in a second. Um, I had the great pleasure of um, uh, sitting with a teacher who was teaching um, a bunch of the 19th century graphic biographies together to students, um, mostly in groups. And I'm sorry, this is a little lower resolution than, than, than usual. Um, I had to reduce it because it, it becomes a gigantic file otherwise. Um, that's why if you do want to use these, you should really go to the OER project website and download the high res ones for students. But, but so here, here's, here's what Eric Christensen, this teacher, um, and I kind of devised. So the first thing Eric says to the students is let's take a look. Let's take a look at the whole page at once. Right, just sort of take it in. And this is in comic studies, this is what we generally say. Um, and then gives the students a few minutes to, to work through all of you know, reading the comic the way that they're used to reading comics, if you will. And then we stop and we ask things about 
things that students may not have noted, but that are part of the literacy and decoding process. Um, a lot of it visual um, rather than textual per se, but um, some of it is identify words in there that you don't know, right? Find at least one word you want a definition of, you know, let's do that. But then, you know, let's start in the upper left-hand corner. The artist here, Liz Clark, um, and I decided that we were gonna use this metal plaque for Odalie Bader's name. Why a metal plaque? And, you know, I mean, the answer is partly because it's industrial and, and it's partly because um, all over Europe, you have these plaques for important, powerful people, um, but not for everyday people like Odalie Bader. And then we look at how the, the gutters are constructed, the stuff behind the main images. What is that? It's, it takes a while, but students finally come up with, that's a factory floor. And there's a reason why the background is you're looking down at a big factory with people working in it, right? That's giving you a message what this is all about. Students often pick up on these pipes running through uh, and it takes a while, but students eventually get that these pipes are telling you where to go, what panel to read next. Um, most students know, um, we set these up the way that comics are set up, but um, you know, it, it helps for students to identify that we've built in that kind of a, a detail as a guide so that they'll start looking at and decoding that kind of thing. And then they notice the lettering, right? So there's two kinds of, of, of um, uh, two kinds of, of boxes within the panel here. One is just text um, that describes, that is descriptive. The other are words that Odalie Bader actually spoke herself. Uh, and again, these look like metal tags that are, uh, you know, uh, 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 pinned onto the page. Um, and we talk about how lettering can tell you uh, the difference between, you know, who's speaking. Um, we haven't even gotten into the content yet, right? We haven't even started to look at that content. And once we do, then we can start asking the questions about who was this person? What was her experience? What was her message? And finally, what does that tell us about the Industrial Revolution in her case? Um, and of course, students working with this are gonna get a, a, a quite a different message than um, what they would get if they were working with Iwasaki Yadaro's uh, biography and putting the two together can be, can be quite useful. So we call this literacy skill decoding. Um, fancier people than me might call it deconstruction, but I'm not that fancy. And um, I just call it decoding because that's what it is. There are codes, right? Things are written to codes in many ways. And you, you take it apart and you look at its elements and, and that, that tells you about the lives that were lived, but also about the argument that the artist is making. And, and in each of these, the artist is making an argument as is, as is the writer. Um, and you would read these just like you would read an article, knowing that somebody had produced it, knowing that because it was produced by somebody, ideas are encoded into it um, and you can decode them. This is a page from Scott McCloud's classic Understanding Comics. And, you know, McCloud's idea here is maybe a tiny bit naive, right? McCloud says, every artist has an idea and they encode it into the physical world in some way, um, as sound waves or light waves in, in, in cinema, uh, into the written word, into music. Um, and the person on the other side then decodes it and gets to pull those ideas out. Now, I, I, I'm a believer that that doesn't really happen perfectly. Um, that actually the person who's decoding is an active participant in making the story in part. Uh, but the idea here is a really important idea, right? It's, it's an idea that everything that you are looking at has been created um, to give you messages. Um, and by decoding, you get the literacy to get those messages. Now, comics. Comics are amazing because um, they have two modes. And what we mean by that is they're encoded in two ways. And I could, I, I have just page after page of examples that I'm not going to force you to, uh, to go through with me. But um, one of the ways that they're encoded is um, images and the other way is written text, right? Um, semiotic uh, text. Um, and both of those things work together 
to tell you what's going on, to give you a story. This is, this is just a, a, a single panel example from Arch Spiegelman's Mouse, where he wants you to know where he, he, his family were hidden. Um, his, grand, his, his father and his, his father's wife, um, not his mother, were hidden. And um, this is, you know, he's using the, the art and the text together to give you that sense. So let's get back to our first world war example. I, I told you that um, I was uh, one of the one of the big questions we have in our world history course is was the first world war a total war? What does that even mean? Um, and so um, I look at how textbooks answer this question. Lots of textbooks address this question. This is a textbook that's used in many uh, high schools. I don't know how many middle schools, but in many high schools that tells you what the beginning of the First World War was like and what the end of the First World War was like. And you know what? I mean, it's pretty good. I mean, in just a few words, in just a few words, really tight, and this is the magic of words, right? Really tight ability to transmit a lot of information quite fast. Um, and this is textbook writing. So it really is you know, information oriented um, it, and that information is more factual than anything else. This is Jacques Tardy's, It Was the War of the Trenches. Same two paragraphs, really. Um, same ideas expressed here. Um, Tardy is in the French school or the Franco-Belgian school, which is probably the biggest, other than Japan maybe, school of historical comics um, in the world. And what I do with students is I just say, let's look at these two pages and look at them as message making about the First World War, right? And when I went to, to, to work with my team, uh, my colleagues to design our graphic biographies, um, we looked at this example. So on the left, you have the beginning of the war. Look how much text there is, right? It's just like, it's populated. It's populated, not just with people, though there are people everywhere in these images, but also there's text everywhere. Um, everything is moving, everything is bold, everything is loud, everything is in motion. And then, Let's look at the end of the war. Scarcity everywhere, hardly any, hardly any words, um, not that many people. It's, it's so gray, so gray, it's so quiet. Um, people, the people who are there are, are sad, they're disfigured, their mouths are closed, they're not, making, they're not making noise, they're not moving, they're still, right? Spend, spend a, few, a few, spend a half hour with these two images and you get a story about the First World War. Well, we didn't want to replicate Tardy. Oh, wait, I should stop and say, um, you'll all get this, but I, I have a video, a 12 minute video on YouTube where I do something like this. I do some decoding with one of our other um, graphic biographies, the graphic biography of um, a Syrian, young Syrian refugee to the US. Um, there are other videos online where people do this and it's worth spending some time with them. Um, We'll spend a little time today, but now getting back after that commercial break to the First World War. Um, so we have two biographies for the First World War and they're both women um, and they're meant to be opposed to each other, if you will. Um, this of course is Rosa Luxemburg, uh, the socialist, but uh, she's here not as a socialist so much as an anti-war activist. Um, you can see uh, the death that's present here. Um, you can see the red star, right? The whole design of the page um, is signifying um, this, her, 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 her socialism, her opposition to the war. You look at the background of that main image in the middle. Um, you see uh, these, these four men wrapped in the flags of their country standing over dead bodies. Um, you read the text, you can read the text in the middle. It's in a different font because of course it's her own words. Uh, where she's telling the story about, um, about death. Um, she's telling the story about having witnessed this, uh, these, these, these dead bodies, um, um, witnessed men being also live men being loaded onto boxcars to be sent into battle. You know, it's, you get a message here. It's, it's sort of deeply affecting in that way, but we juxtapose it actually with an American, uh, an American nurse, Helen Fairchild, it's actually a fantastic story. Um, I work with veterans organizations as well to, to tell stories of uh, American veterans buried in um, US military um, uh, 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 
U.S. military facilities, U.S. military cemeteries. Um, and there's, there's this fantastic story of Helen Fairchild, who um, had to be buried outside of the main cemetery at first because she was a woman in the First World War who died in service. Um, she was a nurse, and we know her story because her daughter, uh, sorry, her, her, her granddaughter, I, I believe it was, wrote about her um, and this classroom experience that she had talking about her. Um, and here you can see the design is quite different. Um, there's still a sort of central feature, which is the cross. And we ask students about what that cross might represent, right? But here's a woman who at the beginning of the war, when the US joined at least, wanted to serve. And this is all about her decision to serve and her family's um, honoring of her memory as somebody who serves and dies uh, overseas. Um, and we want students to juxtapose these two stories. We want students to get not a single story of the war um, necessarily, um, but also a sense of sort of some debate and, and, and dissonance um, about what was going on. And so we, we tend to choose pairs like this whenever we can. But I told you before that what I really think is great is when teachers solve for each other. And this is actually, I mean, I'm gonna tell you that as somebody who makes content for the OER project, I'm well aware that what I do is the, the, the second or third most important thing out there. The most important thing is the community. And what happens in the community is that teachers build things and tell each other about these things that they build. So, so here's um, Julianne Horowitz um, within our community, which everyone has access to, by the way, when you enter the site. Julianne Horowitz talking about how she uses these two biographies um, and then has students look at other biographies uh, written biographies of women in the First World War and create their own graphic biographies. So she uses the two that we give as a model and a way of discussing um, how you create, um, how these things can speak, what they can tell you, um, how you think about art as expressing. She talks about with students, she works with all the other materials to say, what are the big stories of the First World War we need to know about? And then she asks students to create um, themselves from these written biographies. Um, I don't remember whether she has them research these written biographies or not, but has them create their own, their own stuff. Jason, thank you for putting the link up there. Um, so, I, I mean, you know, I mean, really, I love the content we create, but that community is, is where I see teachers creating even better stuff for each other. So, let me finish the Trevor speaking a lot section here with a couple of things. Um, I said before that um, this is partly all about inclusion for us, but authentic inclusion. Um, I haven't looked at my notes in about 20 minutes, so I'll just um, look at them for a second. Um, yeah, okay, so, so I wanna talk about inclusion in three ways. First of all, we do like to give voice to people who are normally silenced. And often that silencing is because of a seeming lack of primary sources. So here, for example, is uh, what we built from an archeological study in West Africa in the 13th century West Africa along the Senegal River um, of what we can recover of the life of uh, a man who was, born, who, was, who was buried in a tumulus there. And what that, that tumulus and that burial tells us about uh, what was happening in that area at, a at the time, which was apparently the rise of, you know, some sort of social segmentation, inequality, noblemen, et cetera, where there hadn't been such things before. Um, so this is a good example of the way that we try to build an inclusivity that is meaningful, that ties into the big story we're telling about the rise of states. Um, this is one of our more recent ones, which I love. Um, which is about Coupe, um, who is, was Polynesian and who, you know, in some ways can be dismissed as a mythical figure if, if you're the kind of person who dismisses such things as mythical figures. Um, but Coupe's story is important on at least three levels. Um, first, it allows us to use and talk about oral tradition um, through the, uh, the, 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 the oral narrator, uh, Himiona Kamira, um, who, uh, tells the version of the story that we use. Uh, second, it helps us to talk about history because it is about how 
Um, it is, it is a, an oral narrative, a community oral narrative about how Polynesian people um, reached Aotearoa or, 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 or New Zealand. But thirdly, um, the whole second half of this is about how Maori today understand this story and how they use it. They use it to build a sense of um, achievement, of living in a, in a long and extended history, of being connected to the land, and of being part of a wider Polynesian community. Um, and so, you know, that's what we focus on uh, in this particular narrative. So that's, that's one of the ways in which we think that this is um, a focus on authentic inclusion. Um, secondly, we bring to the center people who are often on the periphery, which is, is similar, but not quite the same. So um, in talking about the Mongol Empire in our course, you know, we, we often focus on this debate about where the Mongols, well, how should you see the Mongols? Were they these, you know, world conquering horde of, of savages or were they the most highly organized empire the world had ever seen facilitating trade between China and India and Europe? And, you know, how should we, how should we see it? Um, but actually, Sorgatani Becky's story is a great biography for us to, to add a third interpretation because um, what we know from the life of women like Sorgatani Becky is that behind the scenes, the Mongol Empire was kept together by women who were, had relationships with their sisters and half sisters uh, and sisters in law. And those relationships, those networks actually were the way in which a lot got done in the Mongol Empire. It was these, these women who um, were connected, who were wives of important leaders and who had these kinds of connections. Um, and sisters in particular played an important role. So we bring Sorgatani Becky and we bring Mongol women from the periphery of our understanding of the Mongol Empire to the center. Uh, Domingos Alvarez, um, very interesting individual uh, to help us understand the Black Atlantic because yes, he was an enslaved man, but everywhere that he went from his original community in West Africa to Brazil, rural Brazil, and then Rio de Janeiro, and then eventually he was exiled to Portugal itself. Um, he created community around his healing. And his story was all about his ability to do that as an act of revolution, of rebellion, um, of survival, of, of you know, um, being able to make a world around him. Um, and so here is a narrative that uh, doesn't treat this individual just as an enslaved person, although you know, we don't try to, to hide the brutality of the conditions in which he lived, but also you know, treat him as an individual making a world. And the final thing I want to say about that is just this, um, that uh, one of the amazing things about, about uh, visual, about art, and especially about art where we can see a face, um, and believe it or not, as humans, we're all able to know that this yellow thing with two dots and a, and, and, and a line is a face, um, is that it instills a certain empathy, is that it allows us to relate to it uh, a little bit more easily. Deb, that is a great question. Yes, everything has uh, alt text. The newer ones, we're still working on it, but everything is ADA, um, I'll just say compliant because that's the important thing, but our ethos of course is to do even better than that. Um, so we do, we do have um, features that make it possible to use these um, outside of reading the text. Um, as I must say with everything in the course, that is, that is, and anything that doesn't have it yet, we'll be getting it soon. So I've talked for a long time. Um, I could take questions, but actually, if everybody will just bear with me, um, and I don't know, Joe, are there any questions? Am I missing any questions in the Q and A? Um, I don't think so yet. Okay. No. Nope, um, I want to show you. Questions. I want to show you a couple things you can do in the classroom that are kind of fun. Um, so I, I I I attached this packet for you. Um, they're just some worksheets that I and my friends over time have kind of developed little activities and things that you can do in the classroom um, around, around using comics. So let me just show you a couple here and feel free to ask questions as well. Okay, so number one, I get students drawing. And I just watched another teacher use this particular set of instructions. It's fun with students. 
because you ask students to draw a happy line, then you look at what they drew. Even over Zoom, they can hold up their image um, or they can draw on a whiteboard together. Why is it that we all know what a happy line looks like? Um, and hey, hey, Deb, can you request topics and bios? Yes, I, I, I actually, if you were to go to the community, you would see that I've asked um, our community members recently to give us the next set. Um, you can email them to me as well. At, um, I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll type in my email, um, but yeah, we're totally taking suggestions. Um, and then, and then, you know, we ask students to draw an angry shape. Every student knows that an angry shape is jagged. Why? You know, what a great thing to discuss. How do we know that a jagged shape um, suggests that something or someone is angry? How do we know if you were to hit, if you were to draw a person on the ground and indicate that they're hit, they'd hit their head? Um, how would we know that? Every, you know, people have different ways of showing it, but lots of people will draw little stars above their head. You know, it's great for students to think about the fact that we've developed conventions for these things, but some of them are deeply, you know, within us. Um, knowing that jagged is dangerous is 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 deeply within us. Um, so knowing, helping students figure out how art can express ideas is 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 um, one little activity that I and others go through. I have this activity at the beginning of my um, class about teaching history with comics, um, where I have one set of students uh, write about an event that they remember happening in their life, lifetime and their experience with it. And then another student has to draw it. Um, as I said, you've got PDFs of this. Um, my students have a lot of fun with this, but it's also a good way for them to just start thinking about how what are the things you have to think about when you're depicting the past? Um, I do another thing where I, I, I help students to know how comics are made by folding a piece of paper into four pieces. I haven't figured out how to do this on Zoom or remote or Google Classroom. Um, one person has to draw, divide the page up into panels. The next person creates balloons. The third person draws within the panels and the fourth person writes some text. Um, this again just helps them to understand the way in which a page is constructed. Um, and it, it's often really useful if you're gonna work with comics much. This is the thing I do when I'm not working with our one page graphic biographies. Um, uh, you can do this with Google Jamboard. Yeah, I, you can. My university, universities are always behind high schools and middle schools I noticed, and we're, we still just use Zoom. Um, but uh, you can do it on Google Jamboard or there are technologies out there, um, I'm aware. Um, when I'm working with multi-page comics, and I, I do that with serious nonfiction comics a lot in my classroom, um, the main thing that I always do, um, and my 18-year-old my high school senior is passing by, so sorry about that. Um, the main thing that I, I always do is I ask them to upload a page, take a picture with their phone, upload a page to our shared site um, so that we can discuss it. And then tell us, what do you like about the content or why is that significant? Um, what's significant about and meaningful about the art? Um, you know, kind of, you know, talk about the page a little bit. I've also included here um, tools from um, the curriculum for New York City, the Passport to Social Studies curriculum, great curriculum uh, in many ways. Um, it's got these two pages uh, to help students work through graphic histories as well. It's a little different from how I do it, um, but has much the same idea. First, you analyze, you look at the pages, um, you observe things. Sorry, first you observe, then you analyze, you know, um, and think about what does each of these cues actually symbolize or signify, um, and then you try to connect it to the larger uh, world while at the same time um, trying to figure out the message of the whole thing together. Um, so that may be a useful worksheet for you. Um, I also included um, a teacher in Ohio developed this. I love it. Um, you know, taking a page and taking it apart so that one group of students only has the images and has to write the text and another group has the text and has to draw the images. Um, this is a good way to get students literate again about just the idea that the art does some of the work. Annotation is your friend. 
Um, if you can give students pages, either digitally or, or in real life, and have them actually annotate it, um, write in the page what they see, that's wonderfully powerful. Nick Susanis is my favorite theorist in how to teach uh, comics in a serious way. Um, I've given there uh, a URL for his page. Um, his blog is just spinweaveandcut.com. Um, and he does fantastic things with these visual analysis days where he just has students annotate. Um, he actually has them, he often, he, when, when they're in person, he gives them clear sheets of paper, uh, sorry, clear sheets of plastic to put on top and they annotate by layer. That's very complicated. Um, you can just annotate on the page. It's a powerful tool. Um, and I guess the last page I just wanted to say is, uh, here are some of my favorite graphic histories, if you want to use multi-page graphic histories. Um, they cover um, large portions of world history, and uh, I've got lists of others as well. This, of course, is far beyond what, what we think we're doing in the OER project. Um, in the OER project, we're most interested in just providing um, evidence that can be used rather quickly of individual lives as part of these bigger questions. Um, and so, you know, that's why we developed these one page biographies. Um, I hope some of you will find them useful. Um, as I said, I will happily give Joe uh, a list of the ones that we have built so far and that are available to distribute to all of you. And I guess, um, I've been able to answer a couple of questions as we've gone along, but if anybody has any other questions, I would be very happy to answer them. Joe, that's it for me. All right, does anybody have any questions for Trevor? There is one from Deb. Do we have blank templates? You know, I didn't show you those, but um, actually blank comic templates are <laughs> very easily obtained. I, I always just download them every year from the internet because <laughs> um, there are lots of blank templates out there. So um, you, you'll be able to find them pretty easily. Um, I mean, I will say, you know, I try to, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I pointed out sort of the Franco-Belgian school um, of comics, which is six or nine uh, panels across a page that are square, et cetera. And that's mostly what you'll see online. I try to get students to kind of break out of that a little bit, if possible. Let them draw their own, you know. You can do this exercise where you have students draw their morning so far, and you have them think about the morning of the rhythm of, of the rhythm of their morning. Um, and you kind of like think about it, you know, like a heartbeat. You know, when things get excited, you may have lots of liberal little um, lots of little uh, uh, panels with exciting stuff going on and. When things slow down, you may have a bigger panel and you know that sort of stuff. Um, that's that um, that getting them to think about the, the the construction of the panels themselves as part of the process is great. Um, Donna, do you have suggestions for making connections to local stories or histories? You know, I do. There are certain um, there are some graphic histories in the, in the Northeast and in particular of Native American that, that, that including some projects um, that have involved Native American oral history um, folks and communities as part of the conception. I don't know of any in Maine. I know of some good ones in, in Pennsylvania that I could, could uh, recommend, but um, you know, I, I, I don't know. And I don't know of any graphic histories set in Maine either, unfortunately. But I understand why that would be so important. Um, yeah. And maybe that can be a challenge for your students. Trevor, there is a question in the Q&A. Do you have any information to share on the reception from ESL students or any, other, or any students with other language challenges? Um, I don't have that sort of information on me, and I'm not sure if um, we've collected that information or 
um, not for these graphic histories because they're very new. We do track, we do track a lot of information. Um, we don't track students. Uh, we have to do it through the teachers. Obviously, privacy is huge for us. We're trying to respect everyone's privacy and such, and so we can't collect hard data from students. Um, I'm not, we, we collect information from our, our, our teacher leaders and our teacher participants all the time, but I'm not familiar with whether we've collected anything on the comics in particular in ESL. I'm sorry. Last call on any questions that anybody has for Trevor. Can I just ask, um, so my colleague Jason is here. Jason, you could either um, put in chat or I can, I can actually, I can press a button that says allow to talk. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything, Jason. Uh, I'm sorry, what? can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Sorry, I've never, I've never been allowed or elevated in the middle of a session. I feel honored. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I should have warned you first. I apologize. No, it's, it's all good. I, I don't have anything to add specific. Are, are we talking specifically to the ELL question? Or are we talking like generally to your presentation? No, I guess, I guess, I guess, just in terms of the the, the graphic biographies and this sort of thing more generally. Nothing specific. I think that this is one of those things where I've heard a lot about Trevor and his presentation, and I think being able to kind of see it from the kind of audience side has been really valuable. Generally speaking, I really love the kind of elevation of these kind of like familiar uh, materials and the kind of examination and providing that for teachers to then give to students. I think we see a lot of this in kind of like engaging in a kind of visual discovery techniques in, you know, I don't know, political cartoons, we, we, teachers use those a lot. And I think being able to kind of really continue to kind of add an academic lens or uh, I guess a more articulated process to how we consume graphic biographies is a really great thing. Um, so there's not really like a lot to add as far as value, but I just, I'm just kind of commenting on how awesome it is to kind of hear this impact. And honestly, like just stepping outside of myself for a second and thinking about like, you know, middle school, Jason, like I would have loved to have this session in my in my world because I spent so much time reading comic books, but there wasn't anyone really making the connection to how that medium can be used to kind of, you know, go beyond kind of, you know, Spider-Man fighting, you know, Doc Ock and into something that was uh, going to be more reflective of, of my of my background. I think also kudos to Trevor earlier, like this is one of my things I like to hold up. I, I really, really appreciate you referring to uh, those those individuals as enslaved uh, people as opposed to slaves. So I think that like that meshing kind of goes in line with our larger conceptual idea of kind of elevating uh, folks that have been traditionally uh, ignored and really thinking critically about uh, underserved populations globally and giving them the, a, a space in our curriculum. I, it just it's really valuable, really affirming, and I, I just love it. So. I am a full on fanboy. I have told Trevor this himself and now I get to tell everyone how great I think Trevor is. Uh, so yeah, that's a lot of babbling for me, but my brain dump after being quiet for an hour. No, I know. And let me and let me just say one thing. I just want to build on one thing you said, Jason, and then I'll be done, which is just that, yeah, I mean, at the beginning of my class, when I'm talking to students about being serious about comics and history, I show them this, this, this board, the shoots and ladders board and you know, the shoots are things that take you down, right? Mm -hmm. Or snakes, they take you down. And one of the things, one of the great images of, of, of a kid being taken down is a kid who's supposed to be reading a history book, but he's reading a comic book instead. <laughs> and I mean, that used to be just obvious, right? If you read comics, you're gonna get dumber. Um, whereas if you read your history textbook, you're gonna get smarter. Um, and uh, boy, that just flattened the way that we learn so badly, so. So yeah, so thank you very much, everybody, for this opportunity. Thank you, Joe, uh, so much for this opportunity. And um, I look forward to talking to any of you. And um, please, I'm putting my email um, in, in, in the chat just to say um, to those of you who are, who are still around that um, if, um, if, if you do uh, have any ideas for people that we should be doing graphic biographies on, send them my way. And I also say, put a, I'm sorry, okay. Trevor. I no, go ahead, Jason, yeah. You, you let me speak and I just get all over the place. I apologize. Oh, I was going to put a plug for anyone who's still in the, in the uh, 
in the session for a community because I think emailing Trevor is he's incredibly responsive uh even though he's incredibly busy but I think it's always great to kind of put those things in the community as well so that people have an opportunity to kind of you know learn from your questions you know it helps them kind of you know get off the sidelines and ask their questions as well I think there's a lot of dialogue to be had around like the creation process but also kind of dig digging a little deeper and thinking about different examples that have come up that you know may not have been mentioned today that can also be utilized in your spaces so those uh those conversations are always really great to you know witness obviously from afar but also to engage with and this is by invitation to anyone with that link that i dropped earlier to register dive into the the conversation yeah and and truly the final thing except by saying okay you know by popular claim we're going to do a joe schmidt uh, comic um the, the only thing, I, yeah, Faith, it's so fantastic that you asked about classic comics. I, I mean, I just want to say that I didn't give a very good history here. Um, in the 1940s and early 1950s, there were, there were volumes of American teacher and American educator and such published on how to teach with comics. And then suddenly it twists, right, in the 50s, where when everybody becomes afraid that comics are polluting you and turning your kids into, into communists. Um, but actually in the 1940s, educators were embracing it and you know it's just really interesting that it's not like we've always had an aversion to comics as a serious thing anyway joe i'll be done now if you want to um bring people visually to talk to each other i know you wanted to do that so i'll say thank you everybody and i'll be quiet well, like they said in the chat you should never apologize for continuing we're just recording all of this greatness here this is where the good stuff um comes in uh, are there any other questions that people would like to ask to get officially on the record while we're still recording? All right. Well, thank you, Trevor. Thank you for Jason for uh, coming in as the closer in the ninth inning to give uh, that last curveball at the end or a fastball. I don't know what your specialty would be, uh, but thank you for joining us. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for everybody who was submitting questions today. I hope everybody has a wonderful day.